Amit, thank you so much for coming on to Startup Steroid today. Um, I really want to learn more about 30 Friends and the company you're starting. Um, so I'm hoping we can get into you know all the details of the company. But before we do, tell me a little bit about your background and how you sort of started your entrepreneurial journey. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I, well, I'll rewind a little bit because I actually was an entrepreneur since about the age of eight or nine. Uh, I, I started a DJ business actually when I was like I think ten or twelve years old, uh, and you know ever since I kind of, I got kind of bit by the bug. And, uh, you know, I went on, I did my degree uh, in management information systems at Northeastern. Uh, I went on afterwards to do an MBA at Wharton, uh, you know, focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and, you know, along the way, started a couple of nonprofits in the Northeast, uh, you know, followed through a career in financial services, went on to become a consultant at McKinsey and Company, started my own consulting firm because, again, for me, that was the inevitable path was to say, okay, let's what can i do with this how do i add value always a question i'm asking and uh you know i i ran that firm gosh it's been about 12 years now so you know uh, you know successful business we've engaged a lot of different clients and i think that um you know as you know we kind of turned into the pandemic a lot of things changed around us and uh you know we found our whole way of living is, is fundamentally you know, developing at a much, much faster rate than we initially thought. And we're jumping into the future of what does virtual connection look like and how do we interact with people? Uh, and as I was doing this with my own clients, as I was doing this with other folks I was working with, with colleagues, with, you know, uh, my, my alumni network, it really became about, you know, how do I stay connected with these people in a meaningful way? And, it, you know, that that's kind of what kicked off my most recent endeavor. So really kind of jumped over the board a little bit, but, you know, it was really about, uh, it's just something I love doing. I like to figure out what, what, how I can add value as an individual and, and, and where I can make some change. Right. And, and obviously you already highlighted the pandemic, but uh, you really saw a need for this uh, product uh, in the alumni network, the college connections that you had. Um, tell me a little bit about that. How did you actually sort of discover the problem and, uh, you know, thought that there has to be a better way? Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, we were notorious for doing when I was doing my MBA at Wharton was that, you know, every, every other week or every week we would get together and we would go to what we call, you know, the Wharton pub. It's kind of, you get together, you have a couple of drinks with folks and you mingle. And, you know, as I sat down and really started thinking about how did I engage with folks? I, you know, I still stay in touch with a hundred plus folks from Wharton and, you know, why am I so engaged with these people? Why, you know, why do we stay connected? And it wasn't because of what happened in the classrooms. It was what was happening at those events. It was happening at you know, those, the, the time between classes. And I started realizing that that's fundamentally getting stripped back more and more. And in part, you know, it became very, very apparent because of the pandemic. But I, you know, I think some of this happened just because of the virtual nature of things, right? That we're on our phones more often, right? And, and you know, we, we're engaged using different technologies more often. So rather than fight that instinct, I said, well, how do we use that instinct to stay connected? And what, what did I really love about my experience in these, you know, uh, you know these Wharton pub nights and the, the Wharton get togethers that said, I want to connect with these people. And what, what was happening there? So how did I, uh, my goal is how do I re recreate some of that? Right. Uh, absolutely. And at pub nights and, you know, when you're networking or socializing in that kind of an environment, um, you do have the ability to sort of explore and get to know yeah. other things. And that's really what we lose when we go digital. Um, so tell me about that initial idea. W what kind of product did you envision? What, what did you want to develop? Yeah. Um, so initially, I, I hadn't figured out exactly where it plugged in yet. I think that, you know, early days I was thinking, well, there's just got to be a better way for us to talk to one another. And how do we do that? And how do we connect? Right. What, what's really the premise by which we create connection between two people? Um, and, you know, the, this is you know, fundamentally it came down to homophily, which essentially is the, the idea that birds of a feather flock together. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have to be exactly the same. What it means is that if we have a couple of points that we can connect on, it makes it so much easier to connect on everything else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you think of your own group of friends, it's not that everyone fits into the same couple of checkboxes. It's that, 
you know, you probably found something in common. We went to the same university. We had the same interest in sports. We had this something that we had in common. And from there, it stems and, and you kind of grow into different parts of that relationship. Well, what I started thinking about was how do you create a better way to bring those people together and not make it so homophilous that you don't find new people to connect with. So it's kind of taking this mix of let's get you together on the same premise, but then let's add some randomness into that. Let's mix you up with some people that you might not meet. And I think that's what's beautiful for people. I understand that you were trying to sort of, uh, uh, you had a very specific niche in mind when you were developing 30 Friends. So the idea, I, I want to sort of get to how that idea actually came into uh, a product and how you started to sort of, um, you know, develop uh, something that could be, become a business in the future. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when we, when, when we got started, we said, you know, we understand that our goal is to connect people that need help, that want to connect, that want to create a social or professional networks. And to do that, what we wanted to do was engage the right folks. And that's where we started saying, I think universities are probably the right group of people. These are folks that are highly motivated to want to interact with new people. And there are also folks that are really interested in using technology in new ways. So we said, this is probably the right group to start talking to. So what we did is we started running some tests. So we created a product pretty early on, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what that looked like, but we said, let's create a proof of concept. From there, we were able to start engaging some universities. We were able to start engaging some small groups and say, who's interested in trying this out? Um, there were really three sections of people that this kind of fell into. One was the university students. Two was professional organizations, companies that we got a chance to trial with and, and, and professional groups. And the third is events. And events was a little bit unexpected how we connected into them, but it nonetheless made perfect sense that it was about engaging people longer term, not just during the event itself. Um, so we said, let's focus in on the university group because this is part of the community that's most in need of a product like ours today. Um, and where we started you know, finding traction is going to some of these groups and some of the subgroups and saying, okay, let's, let's run a, a session for you and let's make sure that we can you know, create a new event that is exciting, that you're connecting into, that's allowing you to meet more and more people. Fantastic. So how do you turn that into a product? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you developed a product pretty early on. Describe to me what that looked like and what you, you know, what, what it achieved for you. Yeah, so, so the product itself, we, we kind of said, look, we need a better way to do a, a couple of things. Ease the burden on the administrator mm -hmm. and whoever's running the, the actual events. And, and two was to make a less awkward situation for those that are involved, the users of the actual platform, the participants. So to ease the burden on the administrator, we said, okay, well, there's a couple of key things that have been that have traditionally been problems for them, right? It's that, you know, one, there's no ability to kind of introduce people virtually and get them to kind of connect one-on-one -on -one and that business card exchange that you can do. And Zoom, it's really, really difficult. And other platforms, they, they start introducing it, but it's a lot of one-to-one -one engagement. Two is the ability to moderate the experience. Um, you know, this, you're, you're one person, and if you're really good at this, you're still finding it difficult to go on and, and, and moderate these groups online and you're moving them around and you're, you're trying to manage that. And then the last piece is that you're trying to manage multiple sessions. So it can become exhausting for that person to right. say, if I need to do this for a freshman class, it, it is happening every week. And, and then on top of it, I'm doing other things for sophomores and juniors. And it, it just becomes a full-time job. So we said, how do we make this simpler? And what it should look like is I set up a meeting and I invite folks, and that's it. From an administrator perspective, I don't have to do anything else. I don't even have to attend for these events to go well. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the first piece that we said. From an administrator side, that's what's important. Then as a user, what's important to me is I wanna, have, I wanna meet people and I wanna make real connections. And the, right. the, the big in, inhibitor of this is there is a lot of awkwardness in person, but even more virtually, right? So you can imagine, you know, we, we went through and we mapped the, the journey for a customer. What does it look like when they enter, our, you know, a happy hour all the way through to when they, you know, leave? And 
what happens is there's three main points that we that we went out to tackle. One was I've entered a room, how do I choose which conversation to go into? And it turns out that people hate selecting which group they're going to, because really they don't know what they're walking into anyway. So we've kind of taken that off and said, you know what, we'll connect you to folks. We'll take on that burden of connecting you to the right people. Two was, now, now that I'm here, what do I say? Uh, I'm, uh, you know, some of us are great. We'll, we'll talk for out forever and it's fine. And other folks won't get a word off edgewise. So we say, look, how do we make it easier for people to get started? So we give folks icebreakers and conversation starters, things to get that conversation flowing like a good facilitator would. Um, and then we found out that the last piece was, how do I leave this conversation? So uh, we've all been in that, that instance uh, that you're in a group, uh, you're at a happy hour, you've been talking for 10 or 15 minutes and you just can't get away from that group to go talk to another group and you've got to make that excuse of, oh, I need a drink or, hey, there's Joey across the room. So, you know, we've said, let's put a timer on it. And, you know, once that, that time hits, well, end the conversation. If you had a great conversation with someone, amazing. Add that person as a contact. Continue to stay in touch with them. But for now, meet some other folks because while you're here, you can meet these folks for the next 90 minutes. You're going to meet 30 people. And that's where the name comes from, 30 friends. That We want you to meet 30 friends when you're in that session for that, that time frame. Fantastic. So one thing, you know, again, as soon as we start talking about video and people connecting digitally, the first thing people always think about is Zoom. And you mentioned Zoom also. Uh, obviously, there are some differences between Zoom rooms and what you're describing. Um, yeah. But when, you know, investors and customers think about, you know, your product, 30 friends, compared to what Zoom and Zoom conferences, what you know, we experience, we have. Um, how do you differentiate the two? Yeah, and, and look, I use Zoom for meetings all the time. It's great for that purpose, but Zoom is a business tool for meetings and breakout sessions. Uh, it, it's being used socially, but it's a tool that's being used for a, a purpose it was never made for. Um, mm. 30 Friends is a socially focused tool that's made with you know, helping users to meet and connect in mind and then find new people to connect with. So really, you know, the two premises that we differentiate on, one is how do we meet socially? And you know, doing things like auto moderation and, and being able to match folks into these small groups. So you enter a room with 100 people, we'll break you out into a small group of six and push you into another room. You could do some of that with breakouts, but it's a very manual process. Here, we're actually facilitating the matching. We're making sure you're meeting random folks each time and that you don't just end up with the same people over and over again. So there's that piece. And then the next piece is connecting socially. Again, Zoom is not made for this. Zoom is meant to be there for the meeting and leave. What we're trying to do is create an atmosphere where you can connect with that person, stay in touch with these folks, and, and have tools to help drive the interaction. So when you're in a conversation, we're moving the conversation along. When you're trying to meet someone and you want to stay in touch with them, we make it very easy at the click of a button to do that. So it's really what we're doing is we're creating a lot of structure. Um, and the way I kind of describe it is that, you know, if you, can, you, can, if you need to make a cake, you can go and Zoom, Zoom is like buying the ingredients. You can go and figure out how to make a cake and take the flour and all that stuff and you'll bake a cake and it might come out great. It might not, depending on who you are, but if, it might come out great. Or you can just go to the bakery. You can buy this cake. You know exactly what you're getting. It's out of the box. It's easy to use and it's consistent. Right. It's a little bit better too. Absolutely. No, really well said. Thank you for that comparison. Um, now let's actually talk about how you went about developing the product. Um, so you started in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. What did that, those first few months look like? How did you develop the product? How many customers did you bring on? Tell us all of those interesting details. Absolutely. So, you know, when we started, it, it kind of started with an idea, doing testing, uh, getting into Zoom and doing some testing and that's how we found out what Zoom can't and can't do. Um, but, uh, you know, it was going out and just really trying to get users and say, look, for me, this wasn't about creating a product at first. It was about finding a solution. When I couldn't find the solution, I said, well, let's try to build one. Um, so from there, we said, okay, let's start talking to universities if this is really where we want to focus. And we just started emailing 
you know, a- anyone that would listen to us, a couple hundred universities, and we found, we actually took meetings with about 15% of the 250 universities that we actually reached out to cold. So there is a genuine interest in, in, in filling this gap of how do we connect people that are not in the same place. Um, you know, that kind of helped us to understand, well, what do you need in this platform? Can I speak to students and see what they need? And, and, and so a lot of this kind of went into what our first build of the product. So again, I am not a technologist. So part of this for me was finding, uh, you know, someone really smart to, to advise me on how we go about technology and you know, engaged an advisor who is, you know, really, really brilliant in that space. He has his PhD from MIT. He works in the AI machine learning space. And he said, hey, you know, helped us out as an interim CTO. And then we also engaged a third party who found a lot of interest in our product called And Digital. And the CEO of And Digital is also an advisor for us. And they built out the proof of concept for us and said, look, this sounds like an interesting project. How do we engage with you on this? And we said, we need the technical expertise. And they have a company of a I think now about 900 folks, um, and that's what they do. They do app development. So it was, you know, a, a great marriage. And we said, let's build another proof of concept that allows us to take folks, put them into these spaces, um, meet around common topics, and when they meet, we'll then break them out into small groups so they can have a real conversation using video conferencing like we're using now. Right. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. So how did it go? Uh, now you, you're getting people on, you have a platform that you're still building out. Um, what were the initial reactions like? Yeah, uh, there's some good and some bad, and there always is. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the good of it was that we found that a lot of people really enjoyed it. They said, this is really easy. It's really simple. And in our initial, you know, uh, you know, value statement, we didn't say that. And we said, well, actually, that's a huge value proposition. You kind of click two buttons and you're in a conversation. You're not kind of, you know, in hop in looking to where to go and who do I talk to and now what's next. It was really, really simple. Um, and, you know, folks really liked the engagement, the way that we, they were connected. Now, the problem kind of ran into that we ran into was that we built a proof of concept that was not vertically scalable. Um, because we wanted to prove that this works. So we said, great, let's make sure it can handle, you know, some minimum number of people. But this is the double-edged sword of finding someone interested. They say, great, let me invite as many people as I can. Uh, and, and so right. what happened is in some of these demos, when we started running them, they invite a lot of folks and our platform couldn't handle it. It's a great problem to have, but a problem nonetheless. Um, right. So it, we did run into some of these issues, which we've kind of been doubling back on. We're fixing now and, you know, we, we also learned uh, about users, right? So one thing is that we said, hey, we should time bound these conversations and folks have to wait to join. Well, light bulb probably wasn't needed for this to say people hate waiting. Uh, and, and so we said, so what we've done is we've eliminated wait time. So instead, of, you know, we've, we've taken it down to about 15 to 30 seconds is your maximum wait time. Um, and so that people can handle. They can say, I can wait for 15 seconds. I can't wait for 15 minutes uh, to join a conversation. So you know, we, we found a lot of this out very quickly working with people. And we quickly started incorporating it and say, how do we, how do we build this out? Uh, and, and I think along the way, the other thing we started playing with was, how are we generating revenue? Because we had an initial thought of, is it a per user, per, you know, is it a cost per user? Right. Um, and wow, the amount of pushback we got was amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> instantly, I was like, that doesn't work. So we said, well, is there a university licensing fee versus a professional licensing fee? And what's that structure look like as well? And, and you know, again, with universities being the position they are today, they don't have money to spend. So we said, okay, let's completely rethink this. And we actually did a demo with one organization, a nonprofit, and they did a large holiday party on the event. They were able to find a sponsor who paid $5,000 to sponsor an event for a couple of hours just to have their advertising strategically placed and be able to say a couple of custom messages through the, uh, the icebreakers that we have on the platform. Mm, okay. So what we did is we said, okay, let's revamp some of this. So now what's going to happen is you're going to have someone from a university come on the platform. And actually, we're not going to charge you. What we're going to do is you're going to get the platform for free. And even better yet, we're going to pay you to use the platform by doing a revenue share on sponsorship. So you have these two separate universities, and now the platform can bring us together around some common topic, some common interest. 
Um, and this was a huge value for folks. It was like, hey, maybe we can figure out a way to meet other folks within our ecosystem, but then to take my ecosystem and make it so much larger had a ton of value. So that's kind of the new way that we're trying to grow into some of this. And we've just found you know, a lot more excitement around that, that idea. So as we're kind of rebuilding some of the technology, we're also kind of rebuilding the way that we want to get out to folks because it just becomes a lot easier because you know, if, if we can overcome the status quo, which is let's meet in person and let's meet on Zoom, by sharing sponsorship, it's a no-brainer for us. Absolutely. I, I it's a really interesting idea, but uh, I'm wondering as you're sort of testing this, if there's any pushback because, you know, sponsorships are great. And obviously, you know, you want to try to uh, get the, you know, it, it, it eases the process because you're getting a bigger check and then you can, you know, provide it to the users for essentially free or in this case, you're actually paying the users. But the end user, the, the, the student who's just trying to network or who wants to meet his classmates, um, they're not necessarily get, seeing any of the benefits, but they're still exposed to those uh, advertising messages. So have you gotten any pushback there? And uh, what kind of feedback are you getting? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if you take a look at the platform and we have a couple of videos showing it, we're actually quite um, diligent about how we display advertising. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we keep it off to the side, we kind of keep it discreet. But the other piece of it is there are ways to wrap some of that messaging into a common conversation. The example I like to give is if you're in a room about cars, um, it wouldn't be a, a awkward question to ask someone, what's your favorite American muscle car of all time? And, and so there are ways to, you know, that we've been finding, this is exactly what we did with that sponsor was to say, let's ask some questions that bring folks around to your topic without directly saying, what do you think of the 2021 Ford Mustang? I mean, that's, you know, people right. just won't engage on the topic, right? But right. people, you know, car enthusiasts love talking about muscle cars. And they're great at just, you know, being able to kind of put their finger over where the advertisement is and they don't <laughs> even see it, right? So, right. so you know, this is kind of like, look, we want to have the presence. We don't, we don't need to be very overt. We don't need to put videos in front of you and block you from seeing other folks. This is about you engaging other people we're just helping to kind of meld some of the topics of conversation and it needs to be relevant. And I think that's where we're finding that connection with people. Got it. Um, as we get out to more and more users, we'll continue to learn more. Uh, and, you know, one of the other things that we started, that we've started to play with is we're talking to sponsors now and, you know, the, the new suggestion is saying things like, let's, what adds value, right? We can't be on campus the way we were in the past, but if I'm the local pizza place, I want to be, in front of you and by the way it's also a coupon for cheaper pizza so so as a student you say hey this kind of works out to my benefit i, I want that advertisement right so. right right so it's almost like uh, product placement versus regular uh, you know traditional advertising where you're sort of taking them away from the the message uh, to, to sort of you know the topic of the hour yeah and what we've found is that sponsors really like the way that they can position their product in front of folks. Um, and it's, it's done in a way that folks don't feel advertised to. They don't feel like they're right. be, it's really aggressive. But at the same time, unlike using Facebook or LinkedIn, where you can have that targeted advertising, we can actually help to push engagement through, you know, we're being asked to, what should we talk about? How do we introduce ourselves? What should we talk, what should we be saying? So we can actually, guide the conversation to the right topic in a way that these other platforms can't do today. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so I have a great sense of where you are today. What does the future look like? What are you hoping to achieve the key milestones for the next 12 to 24 months and then maybe longer term? Yeah, so you know, the immediate milestone around the corner is that we're going to be doing a new release of the product that's vertically scalable. So we can have more folks in the platform at a given time. And it allows us to kind of do, do two things. One is to continue down this vein of going into our target market and uh, opening up opportunities to have regular touch bases with our users. Up to date, we've been doing events and we set them up so we can learn and then we pull them back down afterwards. What we'd like to do is leave an event up so folks can go every month or every week. And it's the 
call it the Thai happy hour that you're going to do every <laughs> month on here. And, and it allows folks to kind of just come together once a month. And it's the same place, same way, new topics, maybe new advertisers, maybe, but the same format. And, right. you know, what we want is leave it up so we can get more MAU and DAU data uh, to help kind of drive some of that. Uh, the other piece of it is that we want to develop some extra functionality and start talking more about vertical and horizontal scalability. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of the big things that we're trying to do today. And that's kind of the next technical milestone. To do that, there's, you know, we're, we are figuring out how are we going to raise funds to appropriately set ourselves up to do the technical piece and also accelerate our growth so we're not doing three universities, you know, in a month that we're doing three this month and, you know, six, then 12 and, you know, 24 and really trying to grow exponentially. That's awesome. Fantastic. Um, what's the ultimate goal? Are you the next sort of Zoom and IPO and, you know, uh, develop that kind of scale? What's the long-term vision that you have for 30 friends? Yeah. So on paper, that sounds great. Um, and, and, you know, <laughs> it, it, it does. But Look, it, it, in reality, I believe that we're in the longer term an acquisition target. So, okay. you know, the way I kind of see our business growing is, is uh, into a target for a company like Slack or like Facebook or like LinkedIn that's saying, how do I come up with a new way to engage my folks? And, you know, what we're going to be doing is offering a really structured way of doing it and a really structured methodical way of how do you put people together in a meaningful way. Think of it as tweeting, using Twitter versus blogging, right? That we create structure right. around something that's really, really ambiguous. Um, so I, I think that is ultimately where we will end up as an acquisition target. Uh, and, and even today, you hear Salesforce saying this, you know, this is the type of space that they're really trying to grow into is these types of technologies eventually. So, you know, I, I, would, I would be excited to look at that as a prospect for the future. Fantastic. So, I mean, uh, really great job. Thank you for telling me the story. I think uh, you're on the right track. You're developing something that's really new and exciting. So uh, kudos to you for that. Um, we'll offer it up to the investors. If anyone wants to learn more about uh, Amit and his company, uh, log into Startup Steroid. We have uh, the entire profile pitch deck. Everything's available. Um, and you can always contact Amit directly or come to us. We'll be happy to make the introduction. Uh, and take the conversation forward from there. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for listening.